Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. In the mid-1950s, a new film genre emerged in Japan. Kaiju translated Strange Beasts features giant monsters battling each other and wreaking havoc, usually in an urban setting. While 1954's Godzilla is generally considered to be the first kaiju film, the genre's roots can be found in folklore, puppetry, and western cinema. With the impending release of Godzilla King of the Monsters, I want to take a look back at the origins of kaiju and some of the people that brought these monsters to life. The etymology of the word can be traced back to Shanghai Chin, a classic Chinese text collecting ancient mythology. The Japanese would have been exposed to the word and idea sometime after 1853, as for 230 years Japan had been an isolationist country, meaning trade and travel was limited. They would use it to refer to Paleolithic creatures, dinosaurs, as well as mythical beasts from other cultures. Film was still a new medium in the early 20th century, though, as its language was developing, it became clear the possibilities it presented. Willis O'Brien, perhaps more than anyone, pushed these possibilities and what could be portrayed on the screen with his use of stop-motion animation. Now, we covered the basics of stop-motion in our Ladislaw Sterovich video, uh, check it out if you haven't, but O'Brien's work took it a step further, bringing to life creatures that have been extinct for millions of years. While his early films focus on dinosaurs, O'Brien's towering achievement came with 1933's King Kong. Through stop-motion and miniature work, King Kong showcases special effects and scenarios never before seen. This is the birth of Kaiju and would inspire everything that came after it. In 1949, O'Brien was hired as special effects supervisor on Mighty Joe Young, with most of the actual animating falling on his assistant, Ray Harryhausen. Harryhausen had previously worked on George Powell's puppetoons and idolized Willis O'Brien. Together, they would win an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects for their work on Mighty Joe Young. For his next project, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Harryhausen was given full control over the film's special effects. It featured a prehistoric creature awoken by an atomic test. Sound familiar? Its title in Japan, An Atomic Kaiju Appears, is the first time kaiju is used in this context. At the same time, Japanese cinema was in the midst of its golden age. Much of the country's early film history had been lost over the course of the war, where many of those who came to define it cut their teeth on state-sponsored propaganda. In 1939, the Japanese government had taken control of its film studios, and any film release had to follow strict guidelines as to what was shown and how. With the passing of the film law, Japan used the medium to promote its ideals in its colonies, positioning itself as a shining beacon of light, opposed to the West. Aiji Tsuburaya had began his career as a camera operator. Pioneering Kaiju's parent genre, tokusatsu, or special effects film, he introduced many innovations, including superimposition, miniatures, and the country's first use of a camera crane. Tsuburaya would contribute to the war effort by creating the special effects for several propaganda films, the most notable being The War at Sea from Hawaii to Malaya. In it, Tsuburaya recreates the attack on Pearl Harbor. His work was apparently so convincing that when seized by the Allies, it was released as actual news footage of the attacks. While Tsuburaya served with his talents, other filmmakers, like Ashiro Honda, were drafted into the military. Honda had worked as an assistant director, and after the war he returned to the film industry, collaborating with his friend and mentor Akira Kurosawa, in addition to directing his own films. In the early 1950s, both Honda and Tsuburaya were working at Toho. The two would collaborate on Eagle of the Pacific, based on the career of Navy Admiral Isaruko Yamamoto. In 1954, they teamed up with producer Tomoyuki Tanaka for what would become Godzilla. The project started as a co-production with Indonesia that would focus on Indonesian life post-Japanese occupation, though it was cancelled due to political tensions. Imagine that. The recent success of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms led Tanaka to the idea of producing a similar giant monster movie. As mentioned earlier, in that film, a monster is awoken by a nuclear blast. Now, I feel it's pretty common knowledge that Godzilla is a rumination on nuclear power. After all, Japan is the only nation in which the nuclear bomb has been used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, the more immediate inspiration came from the Daigo Fukuyamaru incident. The United States had been conducting a series of thermonuclear tests at Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. Known as Operation Castle, these tests were to determine the viability of the hydrogen bomb. The first test, Castle Bravo, took place on March 1st, 1954. Nearby residents had been advised of this test and a danger zone was implemented, but the blast was more than twice as powerful as expected and some residents were exposed to fallout, suffering radiation sickness. A Japanese fishing boat, the Daigu Fukuyamaru, also came in direct contact with a fallout. Upon returning to land, they were diagnosed with acute radiation syndrome, with symptoms including nausea, headaches, and severe burns. This condition is treated, in part, by blood transfusion, but the Daigu's cruise was botched, resulting in them contracting hep C. Jesus Christ. All but one, the radio man, Akichi Kubiyama, survived. Tsuburaya had envisioned Godzilla as the monsters had inspired it, in stop motion, but with the resources available it would have taken seven years to animate. The compromise, having an actor embody the creature through a costume, often made of rubber, would become a kaiju staple, dubbed Suitmation. 
Side note, the first instance of an actor portraying a monster in a rubber suit was the creature from the Black Lagoon, with a costume designed by Mills and Patrick. This predated Godzilla by just a matter of months. Well, the more you know. Tsuburai's team recreated areas of Tokyo for Godzilla to destroy. I really can't imagine the feeling of watching the panic of a city being leveled with the memory of the nuclear bomb still so fresh. The idea that someone who had experienced it firsthand could be reliving it with relative realism is terrifying. This was an early criticism of the film, with some critics seeing it as exploitive and others claiming it absurd. However, it was warmly received in America when an altered version, starring Raymond Burr, was released there in 1956. Over time, it has become one of the most important Japanese films ever made. While it began as a somber reflection on the nuclear bomb, Godzilla would go on to spawn a genre riddled with camp. It paved the way for Rodan, Mothra, and Gamera, and created a universe that continues to captivate to this day. Though it was clearly influenced by external factors, I see Kaiju as an extension of Bunraku Theater, with the puppeteer using their body to animate. They are intricately designed puppets with more complex Kaiju requiring a small team to operate. Kaiju have been embraced the world over, and while CGI has largely replaced the need for suitmation, the practical effects and charm conveyed by the actors and puppeteers I don't think could be replicated. Now, I am no expert, so feel free to correct or comment down below. We will be exploring this topic further in a process video over at patreon.com slash pixandportraits. You can support us there. Please subscribe if you haven't, like and share this video, seriously that helps out a lot, and as always, thank you so much for watching.